Russ Porteous uh, is going to speak to us today about uh, Drupal Framework for Business Success. Russ has a lot of experience, a lot of information for you guys, so um, please make him feel welcome. Thanks. Hello. Uh, I don't get very nervous at these things because I speak a lot. Um, be interesting to see how I go today because I'm talking to a crowd that I only ever had to do once before, um, and that was to advise some software developers for an ERP company on how crap their UI was. So um, before I go any further, my solicitors always tell me I've got to say this. <coughs> and um, I don't really use transitions in my slides. I went to a presentation before and they've got fancy float in this and explode that and I don't do that. I'm not that sophisticated. So this was the summary I put up on the uh, uh, Dribble Down Under page that um, got me into this room. And we're going to skip through these fairly quickly. But let me start with a story of two people. Hello. Welcome. Let me tell you the story of these two people. And um, one of them is a businessman. And I'm like that businessman. About um, 22 years ago, 23 years ago, I um, was working, sorry, I left the education system and began working for a big American company. And bless them, they paid me to go to university and I um, got a degree in uh, engineering and I also studied accounting, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I studied computer-aided design at RMIT, communications at the Institute of Management, and I did a trade as an electrician. So. When people ask me, what do you do? I tell them I'm a Sparky. Because that's the one that actually pays me the most money. I'm a registered electrical contractor and, and the guts of my business is uh, the maintenance of buildings just like this throughout Victoria. I have staff in, um, that operate in about 60% of the buildings here in the CBD. Um, we look after 50% of the public hospitals in Melbourne and about 250 nursing homes. We have um, lots of cars on the road, and some of you will see, you will, if you ever look around, you'll see them. They say either maintenance essentials or firewise. And that was my business partner just ringing me. So I apologise for that because I rang him about two minutes ago and he didn't answer my call. So we have our staff all over, over Melbourne, and we've been doing that now for 11 years. And it's been a pretty good ride. So I'm going to share some of my experiences today with you as a business person, not as a Drupal person. Um, business people have needs, and I'm one of those people, I've had, I have needs. And my journey into the world of um, online began when I was made redundant. I took a, I took a, year, of, um, a year off from work and set about doing coffee shop reviews. And that was because I liked coffee, and I still like coffee today, and I couldn't um, sit around at home. I had to do something. So I wheeled around my trusty ThinkPad and went to coffee shops and wrote, um, to help, taught myself how to um, program in PHP. Before that, I was a machine code person on a Commodore 64. And if any of you know, it was the 30th anniversary of the Commodore 64 last week. And I cannot remember anything about machine code. I think mobile phones affect your memory. And, well, that's what I tell my wife anyway. And I have no idea at all about really programming anymore. I'm too busy to. I'd like to. I think programming is a skill that you learn over time. And you've got to continually develop that skill, keep honing it. And, and that's why events like Drupal Down Under are so important and so valuable. So my first uh, machine code, I like this. The first machine code um, application that I wrote for a Commodore 64 was an operating system. Who remembers how to use a Commodore 64? Anyone remember what the code was to load a program? Yeah, they were poking and peeking, but what else was there? Had to, in order to load a program from the cassette deck, some of you might be young enough not to even know what I'm just talking about now. You had to, you had to type load something, 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 comma, eight, comma, one. And, and, and these days, we just type the name of the application we want to run, and it runs. Well, my operating system was called the Direct Input Operating System. I didn't turn out to be a Microsoft or an Apple or a uh, Ubuntu or anything like that. It was something that a mate and I did. And um, I really, I was a, a virgin in the woods back then, and I cannot remember any of it. The other thing about um, business people 
we have needs, and we also have the resources. So a business, and let me start, let me say this right from the start. I mean, who of you are in business for yourselves or um, work or self-employed now? So probably 60%, yeah. Now, most of you may not understand this because most of us in this, in this community come at Drupal from being a hobby first. But business is about profit. And don't be ashamed of that, it's okay to make a profit. And that's what I mean by resources. We have, in my business, I, I make a profit, and those resources I use to invest back into improved products and services and solutions. Most of you are Drupal guys. Not all of you, but most of you are Drupal guys. He's cool. This dude is certified to rock. And in fact, as a business person, if I wanted to do business with a developer, unfortunately, I'm going to look at certified to rock. Um, and uh, if you're wondering what your score means, anything with a four or higher is a really good score. Well, I'm a four. That doesn't put me in the top 80% um, uh, though, but I'm a four. And I think that's mostly because in the Drupal community, I've helped with um, editing the help system and lots of content around that. The other thing about the Drupal guy is that he loves IRC, Git, and goes to bed late. How many of you go to bed late? Yeah, still 50%. How many, and of those people, how many of you are coders? Yeah, all of you. Yeah, so what does that say? Yeah, I think so too. You don't get interrupted. If you've got kids like me, they want to talk to you and stuff, and that's good. I think I finished this presentation at about half past two in the morning. Um, but that's just when I like to work. The interesting thing about the businessman and the developer is that they need each other. But, there's a problem. They don't communicate well. How many of you experience that problem? Is that the guy you're doing business with? Yep, yep, yep. And there's smiles as well, and you can't record that on a camera because your back's to the uh, camera lens. They don't communicate well. And the funny thing is that business has its own language. So um, the language of the mega successful business person, and who's this guy? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, right? Is totally different to the language of every person in this room, including me. They talk about corporate finance. They talk about capital markets. They talk about tax minimization, investments, um, OPEXs and CAPEXs. How many of you are familiar with those terms? Yeah, there's a few, yep. So business, the business world speaks a different language. And Drupal has its own language. So what's some of the language of the Drupal world? JavaScript, nodes, PHP, hooks. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't write hooks down. Uh, Drush, committing, Git, what else? Templates, uh, yeah, .tpl files. So imagine if you went to Bo Warren Buffett and had a conversation about .tpl files or include files or, you know, anything else that ha occurs in the Drupal world. He might not understand it and he might miss the value of it. So what language do you understand? You speak Drupal, they speak business. The Drupal world is different to the business world, but they both need each other. Now, here's where my lesson begins. How many of you, you have heard of or seen or read anything from Robert Kiyosaki? Oh, wow. I would say uh, for the camera, that was probably 60% of the room. Robert Kiyosaki is an entrepreneur. He's an author and a speaker. Uh, who knows what his first entrepreneurial project was? Yep. A Velcro wallet. Um, Robert's um, a native of Hawaii. His father was from the, he was the head of the education department in Hawaii. And he's written a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, who co-authored a, a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And what uh, Robert did was contrast the relationship between his poor dad, his father, his biological father, who was in, in charge of the education system, with his best friend's father, 
who is a um, entrepreneur. And amongst the, um, so Robert, he talks kind of in parables, and he talks about um, a whole range of subjects, and mostly it contrasts things, but he talks about financial intelligence, he talks about that companies spend first, then pay taxes, and individuals pay taxes first, and then companies are legal entities that anyone can use, but most people usually don't know how. So one of the things that I learned from uh, Robert is that I needed to understand the language of business. Now, this is where I tell you a little story. About 15, 16 years ago, I worked for an accountant. And he would come to me and I was in charge of sales for a small company, had sales of somewhere around about $5 million. And he would come to me and he'd say, Russ, how's business? And I'd say, it's fantastic, we're bloody busy. And he would come to me every week, how's business? Bloody fantastic, geez, we're busy. How's business? Bloody fantastic, we're really busy. And he came to me and said, when I ask that question, do you know what I mean? So who has an idea of what that might mean, how's business? Anyone in there, in the crowd? Yep. Profit and loss. Profit and loss. What else? Um, making money. Yeah, making a profit. Uh, cash flow. And so he was wanting to know these financial metrics about um, what I was doing, what's our sales forecast like, what's our uh, backlog, what's our um, return on capital invested, those sorts of things. And so he said to me, Russ, you're a pretty intelligent guy, not that good looking, but intelligent, and you don't understand what I'm talking about. We talk a different language. And he actually took me to see Robert Kiyosaki. And he also got me to read a book called The E-Myth. Now, I've recommended The E-Myth to a few people. Look, there's heads nodding everywhere for the camera again. And so The E-Myth is one of those books that I'm, I'm going to recommend a little bit later. But um, he took me to Robert Kiyosaki, and then he also offered me to, offered, and he said, if you go to um, uni and study accounting, and you pass, I'll pay for it. And I did. And I, I don't know, my, I employ accountants now, and sometimes I, I think that I know more about accounting than them, not because I practice it every day, but because I think I understand the, the business part of um, accounting better. And so it's always a bit of a contention. I can't be too smart about it, though, with them. Sometimes they need to win. So what I learned was business and financial literacy. Financial literacy is something that, um, is, as a developer who's looking to sell their services, you need to understand. You need to be able to pitch your offer to a person in their terms and be able to, and so that they can understand it. Developing software, for particularly um, Drupal, is not a cost, it's an investment. And that gets down to your ability, and we'll talk about this shortly, your ability to uh, see the features and benefits in what you're doing. So how do you identify the value in what you're doing? About a year ago, maybe two years ago, I was working with a primary school and they were wanting to spend some money in two areas. I say working, I was the, um, on the school council for my kids' school. And they wanted to invest some money into two areas. One was branding and the other one was their online presence. And if you did a Google search of the school's name, it didn't show up in the top 100 results. And that was because their school name didn't identify their location. So if you're at um, North Melbourne Primary School, you know where the school is. Well, this school's name isn't aligned with the suburb that it's in. And as a result, they didn't show up in any Google search results. And that their, their address was an image stored on the, on the site. So before we did anything about um, improving the school's website, we ran Google Analytics on it for uh, six months to see what was happening. Just by putting Google Analytics on actually increased it in page rank. Maybe Google fiddled with the algorithm a bit. Um, some things we learnt, most of the traffic came from um, Google and it was just people who would put in the school's name identically, not the suburb or anything like that. So the impact on the school was that they, um, they had always had low um, registrations. And so 
instead of saying needing, in order to survive, they needed 40 registrations of new students every year, and they were getting about 40. So we started to introduce um, some changes on the website. Running parallel to that, we did some branding, and I'm gonna talk about branding in a minute. We rebranded the school and invested a whack of money into that and ch totally changed the image. We'll talk about branding. And as a result of those two things, registrations for new student enrolments, plus their work on the mo in getting valuable my school results, uh, increased student enrolments uh, by 200%. So we were able to demonstrate to the school community, the parent community, and the school council that the investment that we made was pretty conservative. For a public school, it was about $24,000 from memory. So uh, pretty conservative in business terms, but as a public school, there was some uproar when we did it, but the results um, proved that the investment was worth it. So here's an example of if you're doing some work and you wanted to get involved in a vertical like public schools, you had to demonstrate fairly dramatic results just by introducing Drupal. Um, and then we also did the, the branding. So from our perspective, um, as a school, the investment of, of developing uh, the school's website with Drupal and being able to demonstrate that back to the school community was a way that we were able to, in simple terms, communicate the value of what we were doing. And we'll talk about my own personal business um, and some examples a little bit later about what we're doing. But some of the phrases um, that are used in simple terms of income and cost of goods sold, expenses, Assets, liabilities, and cash flow. Now, who remembers what this calculator is? Nobody. Yeah, it's an RPN calculator. It's a um, HP 12C, and most accountants will have one of these. It's a reverse Polish uh, notation calculator, and essentially you put your, um, your formulas in backwards and around the wrong way, and it's kind of aimed at not using brackets um, when you're doing a calculation. But um, every accountant will have one of these, and oh, I think it's a bit dorky myself, but they, uh, they use them. So I touched on this just before, but companies spend, brackets, expense first, and then they pay tax, whereas individuals pay taxes first. Now, he here's the common misconception. Who's heard the phrase, claim it on your tax? Surely everyone's hand will go up this time. Yep. So if you claim something on your, on your tax and you, you've made that, you've had that expense at the start of the financial year, how long do you have to wait until you can claim it on your tax? A year. Yeah, right? Because there's a year between you know, the start of the financial year and the end of the financial year. But businesses get to uh, claim that as an expense. There might be some... It, depending on whether it's a capital item, it might be depreciated, which is a whole other kettle of fish, but we won't go into that. But essentially, a business um, spends the money um, and then works out how much tax it's going to pay. And so software and programming uh, is an expense in a business. And so we're talking about, we're not talking about um, after-tax dollars, we're talking about pre-tax dollars. So if any of you are doing... Um, work in the business world, where all of, all of your um, uh, expenses help reduce their taxable income. And if you can find a valuable investment, um, in other words, what you're doing is actually going to add to the bottom line. Who knows what I mean when I say add to the bottom line? You're going to make a profit? Yep. If you, if you, can, if you can find out from your um, analysis of the proposal that it's going to add to the bottom line, then why wouldn't they do it? In fact, it could be one better, that it could have a positive impact. So just introducing an e-commerce site might actually pay for itself. And so they're the ways that you start to sell your services. How do I, um, how can I have a, 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 a never-ending job? And, and one of those ways is, is tie that to the return that the, the person investing in your effort and time um, will get. So focus on their benefits. Mostly that claim it on tax shows a misunderstanding or perhaps a lack of exposure to the business world. And certainly I hear people um, amongst my friendship group 
who will say, why don't you just claim that on, on your tax? Meanwhile, I've already expensed it. You know, I don't, my, ta my vehicle is paid for before I ever pay tax. And that's one of the biggest expenses that I have. Drupal is a valuable solution to many business problems. It's not just a brochure. So what I mean by that is that Drupal can actually provide business solutions. Sure, there's a cost and expense, but it's an investment. So let me give you some examples of really smart investments. I reckon Drupalize.me is one of the, the best in the Drupal community as a uh, investment. Um, Lullabot um, developed that. And originally, if, who heard their recent podcast about um, reviewing Drupalize, Drupalize me, anyone? They won, oh my gosh, go back and listen to that podcast. So they talked about the, the value model of selling DVDs of uh, Drupal training versus leasing them uh, online. And then they talked about the modules required to do it and the investment and the return and, the, and then how much it's grown as a result of their investment. So I think that's one of the best. But there's plenty of e-commerce solutions out there um, that are also examples. Now Anthony, um, sitting over here, put his hand up just a little bit, um, and I were talking just before we started. And one of the things that we talked about was demanding customers. How many of you have got demanding customers? Yep. Well, it's not going to get any better. And the reason is that they're becoming more educated about what they want. Now in my world, I call, them, uh, I call it a compliance cost. So what is the, what, for me, it's the cost of doing business. And that's where um, you need to be very careful about scope creep. You need to be careful about, well, in order to limit scope creep, you need to have a good scope to start with, unless you're doing it on an hourly rate. Um, and you also need to manage the expectations of the client. I say to my staff, don't do anything that will set the expectation so high, not that I'm very tall, so high that you can't repeat it the next time. Does that make sense? So I've got another business mate who's had a, had a very similar business to mine. And his goal was to be the cheapest in the market. And I could tell he was doomed to fail. It was like a, a, a bull in a china shop. My goal, uh, has been just to be consistent. I don't want to set any land speed records. I don't want to jump too high, uh, but I don't want to go too low either. And so in my world, I've worked really hard to be consistent. And I've worked, um, I've read a lot of books to understand that. And that, in fact, I'll just touch on that before we go any further, it's not on my slides, is that I spend a lot of time and effort educating myself. So we talked before about getting a business education. So I would routinely read books on lean manufacturing, lean thinking, Six Sigma, um, professional service automation, professional sales automation. Um, I learn about all sorts of wacky stuff. I go to seminars. In fact, there's a good book, and this would be worthwhile writing down if you've got a pen and a ha paper handy. It's called Flight of the Buffalo. Now don't ask me the name of the author. In Flight of the Buffalo, it says, where do you get, it talks about getting creative new ideas. And so I was, I was the benefit, I received the benefit of that book probably about 15 years ago. Um, I don't think it was from that same accountant um, that I talked about earlier. But Flight of the Buffalo says, go into different um, locations and understand the language of that location. For example, I'm here, now I don't write, Code, I, there are people here that have um, worked with me and for me um, who have learnt, uh, I have learnt stuff from them and I've come here to learn stuff. I just went to the Amiga theme session and I've learnt stuff that I want to apply to my own business. So I'm practising that flight of the buffalo. Go and learn, some, learn something new from somewhere else. Let me jump on to three tips for selling. Now I've touched on one of these but we're going to do it again. Invest in your brand. So how many of you have spent any money at all on your brand? Yep, yeah, that's good. Probably 40% of you. Investing in your brand um, is invaluable. Now, that said, for the first 10 years of my business, it was called Maintenance Essentials. 
My kids tell me there are six syllables in that, and that's way too hard. So investing in the brand, I got professional advice. Um, I, that's interesting. Um, I um, engaged a company that does the, the brand development for Melbourne University, Carlton United Breweries, um, and I paid a fortune for it. And what they helped me find is what they'd call their brand essence. So what makes me tick? And I'll show you that in a little while. And it's not just brand slapping. Um, who knows what I mean when I say uh, logo slapping, sorry. Yeah, I see a few heads knocking. So logo slapping is not branding. It doesn't, it doesn't convey who you are. So uh, look professional. Now, I'm going to offend uh, the guys that did the presentation on Omega uh, earlier. Um, devs with hats. And the reason I'm going to offend them is that they wear hats. And I, was over, I overheard their conversation um, at the start of the session before they were actually talking. And it was it, who's the, who's the guy there that spoke? I wrote, I wrote it down. He said something really bloody funny. Uh, he's, he, essentially what he said was, I wear a hat. And he was proud of it. And that's okay. Um, but if you want to get paid like a tradesman, how should you dress? Like a tradesman. If you want to get paid like an engineer, how should you dress? Like an engineer. So how do you think my staff dress? They're tradesmen. Awfully quiet. Not a trick question. Like a, like a what? An engineer. So I employ tradesmen that dress like engineers. They wear um, business shirts. They have collars. They have long sleeves. Um, they wear trousers. And yeah, they're going to get dirty. So they have a spare change of clothes. And I think our hourly rate is amongst the highest of all tradesmen um, in my industry sector. So look professional. The, uh, there was an industry, the photocopy repair industry, used to be dominated by essentially tradesmen. And about 20 years ago, I think it was Canon uh, professionalised that industry and the price for a photocopy repairman went from, let's say, $100 to $300 an hour. <laughs> I'm being spied on through the door. So if you want to get um, paid more, look professional. The next thing is to listen. What things can you listen for in a meeting? You can listen for opportunities. And there's a lady who's a friend of mine, and she is incredibly good at um, finding new opportunities. So I'll give her one, one project to do, and she'll find five others to do as well. And she's so convincing with me that um, I end up having to pay her more. You can listen for instructions. Sometimes your instructions are not so clear. And there's a really powerful way to understand, and in fact, the same lady taught me this, um, to understand if you've got it right, is you re-ask the question. So what you're really saying is, I should do this, this, and this. Is that correct? And then you wait for the answer. And if they say, no, 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 that's not what I said, you say, could you just explain it to me again so I've got a really clear picture? And that will help manage that scope creep. You can listen for advice. I have a client um, who uh, runs probably the biggest hospital in Melbourne, and my relationship with him over the last 10 years has been fantastic. And he's taken me under his wing and he gives me advice. It's like a father figure to me. I really value what, what he says. I had an issue with um, one of his staff recently and I said, I don't know what to do. And his advice to me was invaluable. So just to give you some concept, a concept here, and I'll, let me think of the name of another book as I'm talking. Um, uh, something for life. Customers for Life. That's another book to, that's worth reading down, writing down. Customers for Life, and I think the author of that book is a guy called Carl Sewell, S-E-W-E-L-L. -L. If I um, didn't listen, listen to this guy's advice and I failed him in some way and I didn't listen to the opportunities and I didn't listen to his instructions, I could have lost millions of dollars. So let's say my relationship with him in one year is worth $100,000 and I have him for 12 years. How many dollars have I just got? 1.2 million. So Customers for Life, the book, talks about lifetime value. Uh, and that's something that is really important. 
The other thing is to listen for signals. Signals um, that come and say, you're going too far, or you're not going far enough with what you're doing, or could you give me more advice? Now, I'm, I'm um, a person that loves to be educated, don't I, Rick? Absolutely. Simon, love to be educated. You, if, you, if you spend the time with me to, to get me to understand what it is you're doing, then I'm more likely to buy from you quickly. There's a, a company that's trying to negotiate um, um, a novated lease package for my fleet of cars. It's worth millions. And the guy just didn't have a brochure, didn't have anything to tell me about it. The website looked fantastic, but the substance underneath was useless. And so I'm actually not quite sure whether I want to buy from them, but their website looks compelling. Their testimonials look compelling, but there's no substance of what they're saying. They're not educating me. Build relationships and ask for advice. They're the other two things you can do by listening. So let's talk about leverage. I've just got up a uh, word cloud here. I couldn't actually describe what this means, so I'm just going to talk to it. Um, in my world, and uh, I've talked to some people here about this, in my world, leverage is doing more with less. Now, many of you, uh, I won't ask you to put your hands up for this, but many of you sell your time by the hour. So if you stop working, oh, here we go, there's one hand. If you want to, you can. Sorry? Yeah, so if you, if you stop working, how does your income, how is your income affected? Dramatically, yeah. Thanks for that. My brother is a, um, I don't, oh, this is going to sound terrible, but I don't think he's as smart as me, but I think he's more intelligent than me. He, um, he's a welder, and he did, his, a, he did his welding, he started his welding apprenticeship before he finished high school. Now, I grew up in the country, and he would have to travel an hour and a quarter to get to TAFE to study to be a welder. He, um, in, the, in the trade world, there are Olympics for tradesmen. And he's, um, he competed for Australia in the trade Olympics as a welder, and uh, I think he travelled to France as a welder. And so he's pretty good at what he does. And up until about five years ago, he sold his time by the hour. He could weld underwater. I don't know how you don't get electrocuted when you do that, but um, he could um, do stainless steel, which is a bit tricky. He could do. He could weld foil. He's um, he's an exceptional welder. But he and I both ride motorbikes, well, not so much anymore. But um, he had a slow speed accident. In other words, he was doing walking pace on his motorbike, hit some sand and fell off, and shattered his shoulder. He dislocated the shoulder, shattered it, broke most of the bones in his shoulder. And so as a welder, and you're carrying around chunks of steel and big heavy equipment, how much income was he getting for the next four months? Not much. He had a huge mortgage and a huge responsibility. So he came to me and said, what should I do? And I said, employ someone. That's a start. And so we had to go through the process of teaching him how to employ someone and get leverage. So when, if you're a business owner, you can get leverage by employing another person. But there's more than that. There's, another way, there's other ways to do it. Um, I talked about the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad before. It talks about the cash flow quadrant. And you can Google that. You can do it now if you like. Um, the cash flow quadrant, which talks about being self-employed versus being a business owner. And that's the transition my brother had to make from being a self-employed to a business owner. But there's another way that you can also get leverage. And that's by, as a, uh, if you wanted to stay as a freelance paid by the hour, you could use your spare time and go and develop a product or a service that, that you can sell into the market. So an, uh, an example of that is Drupalize Me. So if all the guys that at Lullabot are asleep in the middle of the night and somebody clicks on a link that says buy, how much effort did they have to expend at that moment to get that new customer? Not a lot. So there are many opportunities, and I don't see this talked about at all in the Drupal community, about building, um, building services. So many of you are multi-talented, skilled developers, and if you used your skills to develop um, a product or a service that has um, a value, th then you, know, you, can, you can do the coding for fun. I think... Um, 
the guys that own uh, freelance.com, I think it was freelance, it was one of those companies. It was, it was being run by a guy in Fiji and he would spend about four hours a week on it. So he developed the application once. Millions and millions and millions of freelancers were using it to trade in services. And this guy was just creaming a couple of percent off the top of every transaction. You know, you think about all of the services. Um, how many of you are from Melbourne? Most? Or, yeah, so CityLink, right? They charge you just a couple of dollars for every sector of the freeway. And a couple of bucks doesn't sound like a lot. But when you look at how many cars drive in and out on the freeways every day and whether you've got a tollway in some other part of the country or wherever you come from in the world, um, those tiny little transactions add up. So develop a product or a service that has a tiny little transaction and, and not too big. You know, Drupalize me is good, but there's a, there's a resistance there to spend the money because the transaction cost is so high. So if you can develop a product or a service that has a low capital cost and uh, small transactions with lots of them, then I think you've got a product or a service that could um, radically change the way um, that you get paid. The other thing is, um, and, and I've maintained this for as long as I can remember, my last job working for someone was um, an American company and they, um, they taught me that it's the value of information that makes us money, not the work that we do. So why is Facebook so valuable? Because they collect a lot of money. Or they collect a lot of information. It's not because they've got a, you know, a special product that we all buy, it's because they collect information about us. I said I was gonna um, tell you about my, um, I, uh, I actually wrote six, but then the next page I come up with one extra, I forgot Devel. Um, these are my seven Drupal modules that I reckon are, are rippers. Um, not, they're from my perspective as a business person because I see um, what you guys do and I think these are rippers. So, um, Agia, Drush, Views, Media, Amiga. I love Amiga after being to the last session. Um, for me, I love my backups. My um, business is pretty much in the cloud. And um, Devel. So let, you tell, let me quickly tell you about my story. Uh, my business is called Firewise. We have cars like this all over Melbourne. Some of them are still branded in the old brand, which is Maintenance Essentials. Um, and our um, um, strategic objective is to discerning business owners, Firewise develop, dev delivers reliable, expert, and innovative maintenance solutions that maximize the reliability of fire protection systems and equipment. Now, when I started this business, I set out to dominate the web. And I do it now with the help of Drupal. So if, you, if any of you have got um, you Google fire protection maintenance now, you'll see my company. It'll show up as maintenance essentials. Um, and you'll see that I'll come up in the first one or two. If you use any of the keywords used in my industry, um, then Drupal helps me get to the top. We don't pay for any advertising on Google anymore. Haven't done for years. Used to. Um, AdWords was good. In fact, the first day that I ran AdWords, um, it paid for itself for the next year. Um, and now my, my competitors are a little more intelligent. Drupal's part of our business solution. My business, and Simon, you've worked in my office, my business is totally in the cloud. Um, we just got rid of our last server. So I have nothing except a router now. <laughs> Simon helped me get rid of that. So, so we, everything that I do is in the cloud. I could start working now. I could issue a purchase order, make a payment, run the payroll, um, update this presentation, what, even though I'm running it in PowerPoint now, um, was written um, using Google Docs, we use Google Spreadsheets, we use Drupal, um, and I'm going to talk about that now. Perfect. Drupal's part of our business solution. We, um, how many of you ever tried to add media to a Drupal site from an iPad or an iPhone? You can't do it, right? Well, uh, we worked out how, and it's a bit of a hybrid solution. I'm not going to tell you all exactly how we do it because I'm not that smart. Um, but essentially, we're able to, we, we've got an application. So my staff maintain buildings like this. So if that exit, si exit sign wasn't working, they would record that on their iPhone 
and be able to take a photograph of it, maybe even get a client signature and push that um, information back to a website where our staff can manage it. And essentially it sits in a queue and the, and the queue ha includes information and they can prioritise it and they can do all sorts of stuff with it. So Drupal, we, in that, we, what's, the, what's the module called, Rick? Well, it's not there yet, but its working title is Form Receiver. The form Receiver. And, and it allows us to capture... Uh, um, you, can, you can submit uh, forms uh, from your iPhone to... Or an iPad, yeah, yeah, to Drupal. And we can then um, publish that data either publicly or privately. I talked about some resources before. Um, Rich Dad Poor Dad is a great book. I, I cannot recommend that highly enough. It taught me basic financial literacy. Even though I'd studied accounting, Rich Dad Poor Dad. The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, another great book. Ah, oh, yeah, well, it is The E-Myth Revisited. Sorry, I probably didn't, didn't get that right. Um, Flight of the Buffalo, there are three. Anything else, Simon? I've given you a million of them. How many of you read the E-Myth before? Oh, good, good chunk of you. Um, yes, it's a, it's a great book. And that will tell you whether or not you should be um, self-employed or not. Grantslink.gov.au is a great place. A lot of, um, you, might, you may be aware of this, but a lot of software development is, may be able to receive um, grant funding from the government for its work. So the work that Rick and I have done is, of, um, well, we, we could have applied for a grant to, to do that work. Um, and a mate of mine, some of you might have heard of him, his name is um, Brad Sugars. He owns a company called Action International. They're a um, business coaching business. And Brad has, written, he, written, Brad has written heaps of books. Books, another form of leverage. In fact, he's got a game called Leverage. And um, you go to um, bradsfreebooks.com and you've got access to a whole bunch of um, e-books. So they're the resources that I've um, got with you. Some of them are really good. Well, they're all really good. Um, and I can um, highly recommend Brad's books. Um, I'm hoping to take in questions now and hand it over to you. G'day, Russ. How you going? Um, no, nah, do you need, do we re need to record this? Hello? Yep. Um, yeah, just more of a statement and just to say thanks very much for the uh, presentation. It was great. Um, especially about the, the, um, Thank the you. Thank you. ratio between adding value, you know, more so than what your customer expects, but also against, um, as you said, keeping it under control and so forth. So, you know, your customer just doesn't keep on expecting the higher type of uh, delivery and so forth. So, yeah, yeah it's so very I, important I in a, business. I had a, a similar discussion, and I, so I think I understand is about scope creep, yeah? Yeah, yeah, and just, and just that, um, that also, just to differ, differentiate yourself against your client, uh, cust uh, your competition about um, just adding more to adding more than what your client expects and so forth, just in anything that you do. For yeah, that, so that's a great question. And in fact, for, for me, I've got a really uh, sneaky way of handling this. I develop scopes for the services that we provide that are quite detailed and I publish them online. I make them freely available. So if we wanted to test the air conditioning system in this building, I'd write a scope for that. And so I share that with my clients, but also gets me Google results. And that's one of the ways that I um, increase my traffic. But by defining a scope, most of my clients don't come to me with a clear understanding of their scope. They come to me as a professional to help solve their scope problem. So I think if you want to uh, eliminate scope creep, you need to have a very clear scope to start with. And then be prepared to say, no, I think that's a variation to the original scope and then apply a dollar value to that. And we do that, we practice that in my own business. In fact, I had to have a discussion on Friday about that exactly um, with my staff, is how do we manage scope creep? How do we get, and then how do we negotiate uh, variations? How'd that go? Scope. Any other questions? Um, yeah, just to sort of follow on a little bit of that, I noticed um, that you've got quite a few uh, system gurus up here. I was just wondering, do you have a formal system for procuring software management and Drupal development with your own business? Yeah, I do. We use um, uh, an, 
enterprise accounting system called NetSuite, and didn't even get a chance to talk about that. Um, so we use a system called NetSuite. Any of you heard of that before? Yeah, a few of you. So that's a um, software as a service, just like salesforce.com, and it manages um, all of our, um, uh, everything in our business, CRM, um, human resource management, accounting, general ledger, everything. Uh, that's what I use. And um, Simon was kind enough to uh, take the NetSuite um, API, and well, not API, what was it? Libraries? Yeah, and then hack those and make them work more efficiently so we can do other things with it. Now, I didn't even get to talk about that, um, but you know, being able to leverage on some of these systems APIs at, with Drupal to do other fancy stuff. So that's the main thing. Is that, did I answer your question? Yeah, it's kind of more about how you manage your software providers than, you know, talking about scope and development and how you understanding what the problems are that you're having and how you convey that conversation to your software people. Oh, see, the reality is that the business isn't that big and I'm reasonably competent when it comes to those things. It's big, but it's not that big. Um, so I can actually look them in the eye and say, here's what we want. The biggest challenge is, and I'll go back to NetSuite, is that they're very inflexible. Um, and so I wrote a specification of what I wanted and they didn't deliver on that. And then I had to take them to court because they essentially told me a porky pie. Um, but it, it's, the, the bigger they are, the harder it is. Um, I have, so the, I'll tell you that our, our major vendors in that area is Google. So we use Google Apps extensively and NetSuite, and that's it. After that, um, everything is, is Drupal, really. Um, yeah. Yep, one more quick question. It's more of a comment than uh, on the financial system and the ERP that, that you're using NetSuite. There is an open source alternative and we do migrate from NetSuite. It's called Adempier, um, very large companies use it. So it's another alternative to NetSuite. Yeah, another alternative to NetSuite. I'm not, I'm not uh, a NetSuite. I oh, like, I love it, and it does what I want. Um, the new one that I've been also interested in following is um, Zero, spelled X E R O for small business. No, it doesn't. It's got some limitations, but pretty nice. So, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you. I hope it adds value to your business. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Appreciate that. Everyone, it's lunchtime. We've got. Uh...